Father, we ask for your blessing now on the preaching of your word, that your spirit would speak directly to our hearts, that you would tune our ears to hear your voice speaking from your word to convict us and exhort us, to encourage us, to grow us. Father, that we as your children might be known as people who don't just listen to the word of God, but as people who do it. By the power of your spirit, and all God's people said, amen. I think that if we <clears throat> pay attention to the Bible, but particularly the book of Judges, we could say sort of conclusively uh, that a single generation is all that is required to corrupt a nation. And the book of Judges is the story of how that happens sort of over and over again. Because the opposite is true. A single generation can provide the salvation of a nation if they will do a couple of key things. Repent. Follow. Follow God's way. We're here at the end of the book of Judges, and uh, Samson is the name of the last judge that is clearly named as a judge in the book of Judges. You might say that Samson sort of ends the book of Judges, but then we have a few more chapters afterwards that gives us what some of commentators call the first conclusion and then the second conclusion. And we are in the first conclusion, a story about Micah and a Levite that he hires to be his priest. I made the point last week uh, that Micah is a leader of his family and perhaps a clan. And, um, and he seems not to know God's word, which is crazy because in the time of Moses, Moses was very, very, very clear. You could not be more clear than Moses was. Over and over and over, he teaches the people of Israel, listen to me, it's not hard. God's telling us this is how we ought to live. Now, either you do that, and God is with us, or you disobey that, and God will be against us. We are God's chosen people, which does not mean we get a get-out-of-jail-free card. What it means is we are held to a higher standard. Don't ever get that backwards. Don't ever believe in the false prophets and, uh, and the liars and the charlatans. It's really, really easy to tell the difference between someone who is a con artist, a charlatan, listening to demons, witches, that kind of thing. It's not their appearance. It's not their packaging. It's this. Are they telling you to obey the Bible or to disobey the Bible? If they're telling you all of the things that I've already told you, then they are from God. And if they're telling you something new, do not listen. Pick up a stone and start throwing. <laughs> Drive them out of the land. And um, Moses uh, tells them in the book of Deuteronomy, so after the Bible is sort of been, the book of Deuteronomy is a recapturing of the whole Israelite story of God founding them as a nation, them receiving the law. And, uh, and Moses says, don't say that the word of God is too hard to do, that it's too far away. Who's to know what it says, you know? Does a man have to climb up into heaven to hear God speak it and come back down and tell us, no, it's right here. It's real simple. Do these Ten Commandments and follow these other things. Here are the ways for you to come back, to repent. Here's the priests. Here's the, here's the Nazarites. Here's the, they have this whole system in place. And it seems that very, very soon, uh, the people started perverting their faith with idolatry. Now, it's not the kind of idolatry that you might think. Uh, the Israelite idolatry, we would call syncretism. So it was almost never this. Oh, Jehovah, Yahweh, nonsense. We're going to chase this God here. It was almost never that. It was always this. We love Yahweh so much. Um, we need to create some sort of a object to focus our worship in the name of Yahweh. And so they would make a cast image. They would make a carved image. They would set it up and say, now this represents the one true God of, of Israel. 
And God says in the Ten Commandments, no. Don't make a carved image. Don't make a metal image. Do not make me like the gods of the nations around you. That's the way of the demons. That's the way of the charlatans. Those are no real gods. If you have to rescue, a God, if you have to feed a god, if you have to go to an idol and offer it things in order for it to be powerful, that is no god. I will never ask for my people to come rescue. I'm God. You're my people. I can do whatever I want because I'm God. And the definition of God does not fit what all the other nations around there are telling you gods are. Don't make me like them because I'm nothing like them. There is no God like me. No God stands next to me, over me. I am the Lord of all lords. The God of all gods. And the people of Israel would do something called syncretism, which would be, first they would do the image, the picture, the statue, the whatever. And then it would be like, well, God has angels who do as well, right? So like, why don't we add those in there too? And then uh, they would be like, oh, uh, our neighbors have a statue, a deity, who's not too different from our God. They have a God who created things, who's the God of the sun, or the God of the fire, or whatever. And they would add that one in there, too. And they would add not just the ways that God permitted people to worship him. They would start doing extra things. They would start offering sacrifices, blood sacrifices that God said. Incense sacrifices that God said no. They wouldn't do it in the right place. They'd do it in their own backyard. They'd do it underneath every uh, tall tree up on the mountaintops. And God said, no, don't do that. Worship me at the tabernacle. So it was like one of those things where it's like, uh, hang on a second. Um, you true Israelite people are um, causing us to not be accepted by the people around us. Hey, listen, there's a lot of good things that will come from us doing, not, we still follow Yahweh deep in our hearts, okay? We have a private faith that is between me and God, and believe me, me and God are okay. And what does it matter if I do just a little, if I do just a little accommodating? And so we saw last week sort of where that goes. And it ended, I can't pre re preach last week's sermon, but it is available on YouTube. Uh, verse 13 of chapter 17. Micah, who had hired a wandering Levite to be his family priest, said, in chapter, the, end, the very last verse of chapter 17, Now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as a priest. He was chasing the packaging. Our faith looks like this. How do I take my idolatry Cram it into the packaging of Yahweh worship. And one of the key things was, you can't just have any old priest. You've got to have an ordained priest. You've got to have a Levite as your priest. And here was a Levite who was willing to bend the rules to do things that the law of God said, don't do them. So that he could have a position, he could have money, and he could have power in Micah's household. That's how Micah lured him in. Why? Why don't you be a father to me? Why don't you be the priest of my clan, my family? And so it pleases the Levite. He says, okay. Now chapter 18, verse 1. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And in those days, the tribe of the people of Dan was seeking for itself an inheritance to dwell in. For until then, no inheritance among the tribes of Israel had fallen to them. So the people of Dan sent five able men from the whole number of their tribe, from Zorah and from Eschatol, to spy out the land and to explore it. And they, the people, said to them, the spies, go and explore the land. And they came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and lodged there. A few brief sort of the explanation so that this will make sense to you. Uh, the text here says, one, there was no king. This was in the time of the judges, okay? Two, uh, the tribe of Dan had not settled anywhere because no allotment had fallen to them, which does not mean an allotment 
had not been assigned had. But we were told way back in chapter 1 of Judges, when the author is giving us sort of an overview of the beginning of the conquest and sort of when the conquest is just kind of coming to a conclusion, maybe not a conclusion, but like a point of equilibrium. Then this is when the judges started with Othniel. And it says very specifically, Dan was given an, appo an apportion down in the south. But the Amorites were there. The Amorites had iron chariots. They resisted. They did not go easy. And the tribe of Dan could not drive them out because they had chariots of iron. Okay, so what does Dan do? Well, what they ought to do is get together and say, Lord God, you've got to go with us. We're going to drive these people out. It seems impossible. But with you, Lord, there's nothing impossible. We'll take it inch by inch, foot by foot, meter by meter, mile by mile. But we will do this thing because God said it and it is possible. Instead, they went, Maybe there's another section of land that's a little bit easier. Maybe there's a place that we can conquer that doesn't take so much work. Why would God give to us a place that's really, really hard when I'm sure if we look around, we can find a spot that we can just fit right in? They didn't know where that was, so they sent people out. Go on out. Now, what does this say about the timeline? This is like, confusing about the time because we're told this story in sequence after we're being told the story of Samson who's the last of the judges of Israel and so it sounds it feels to us like here's a story about what happened after Samson because that's usually how stories are told okay but Dan in the time of Samson didn't have any place to live. They'd been living for like 300 years or so with, without any, that's in a refugee camp. A, that can't be right. There's a hold that in your mind. There's something about the timing of this story here that's supposed to pique your interest. But what you know is Dan hasn't done what God has said. They're seeking an alternate way to get something like what God has done. This church always is an indicator of disaster. It is when the people of God reject the thing that God has called them to for something that is like it, but isn't it. So here the uh, people from Dan come to the house of Micah, and they're lodging there. Verse 3, when they were by the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young Levite. Now, that's really interesting, because the Levite isn't from there. He's from some other part of Israel, held by the tribes of Judah. He's come all the way up there, and this confuses some commentators. And they say, well, maybe he just had an accent or something like that from a different part of Israel. And they came, and they just heard his accent. But it doesn't say they recognized his accent. It says they recognized his voice. So these five spies, this person either had to be a close personal friend of these spies, or this person had to be so well-known and such a public figure that they recognized his voice just from hearing him in the household, which I think is the case. So they turned aside and they said to him, quote, Who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? What is your business here? And he said to them, this is how Micah dealt with me. He has hired me, and I have become his priest. Question, is it all right to hire a priest? No, no, it's not, not at all. There is no provision for that in the law. Priests are allowed to collect tithes and offerings, and God had a system for when people would do the correct worship at the correct Place, there was a system so that the tithes and the offerings were used to support the priesthood. But to outright hire a priest is not just questionable, but bad. That, that's bad. That would be sort of like you are really into the prophetic. All right? You're really into the Holy Spirit speaking, and you hear that someone is really inspired by the Holy Spirit, and you say to them, hey, I want to set up a deal with you where I can call you anytime, and you could just bill me by the minute. 
you know, 100 bucks a minute, whatever you want. And I get to ask you questions, and then you will respond to me. Um, and then at the end of the time, you just bill me, and I'll pay it. I'd be happy to pay it. I'm like, hey, that's a pretty good deal if you're a prophet. But as prophecy for money is absolutely forbidden. Evil. Evil. Why? Because it corrupts both the prophet and the listener and the office. It corrupts everything. It turns it into a commercial venture, which ruins what happens when the Spirit of God is flowing. The Spirit of God always resists the temptation of money. When Simon the sorcerer says to the apostles, hey, I see the spiritual stuff that you're doing, and I also see that you can lay your hands on people and impart the Spirit. Here's some money. Put your hands on me and bless me. I want to do what you're doing. And they say, cursed be you and your money. <laughs> no. So that's what's going on here. He's saying, they, he just hired me. I don't know. Seems that they got a famous guy, a something guy, who's a priest, who gets hired. Verse 5, and they said to him, inquire of God, please, that we may know whether the journey on which we are setting out will succeed. Now, they should have known from the very beginning. This is not good. You should do what God told you to do. Go do that. And it's fine if you're hesitant to go and do it, saying, Lord, I need some confirmation here. I need some, my faith isn't strong enough to do what you have called me to do. Something else entirely to go, no, 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 I'm not going to go do that. I'm going to go do something easier that might be a little bit more profitable. Now, who can I get who's spiritual, who will confirm to me that I should go over here? And that is terrible and wrong. And a real priest would have said, what? I was like, you want me to contradict God's word? It's like, it's written in the books of Moses what your allotment is. <laughs> okay? It's clear. But no, he doesn't do that. The priest said to them, now listen to this powerful, inspiring prophecy. Go in peace. The journey on which you go is under the eye of the Lord. Which means, Nothing, which is what happens when prophets start prophesying for money, when priests start priesting for money, when pastors start chasing influence and wealth rather than the call of God. What happens is you get a spineless jellyfish that doesn't know the word of God, doesn't do the word of God, doesn't speak the word of God, and instead gives you fortune cookie type things. Wow, it has all of the feel of something from God with none of the content. It has all of the packaging without any of the actual goods. Verse 7, then the five men departed and came to Laish, saw the people who were there, how they lived in security after the manner, manner of the Sidonians. Okay, this, this verse does not say they were Sidonians. It said they lived like, after the manner of the Sidonians. Okay, quiet and unsuspecting, lacking nothing that is in the earth and possessing wealth and how they were far from the Sidonians and had no dealings with anyone. This would be like, I don't know, you're a robber, a pirate or something like that. And then you find an island out in the middle of the ocean. It's like, these people live after the, after the manner of the Americans. <laughs> no fortifications anywhere. They're rich beyond their wildest dreams, and they think nobody's going to attack them. But they're way far, they have nothing to do with America. They just live like the Americans. Who, who should we rob? Or like, these guys who are like the Americans but aren't actually connected to America. That's who we should rob. Uh, verse 8. And when they came to their brothers at Zora and Eshtael, their brothers said to them, what do you report? So they've gone and spied out this place in the north of Israel. They've gone back to their homeland. Now the people are saying, what do you say? They, the spies, said, arise, let us go up against them. For we have seen the land, and behold, it is very good. Will you do nothing? Do not be slow to go, to enter in and possess the land. As soon as you go, you will come to an unsuspecting people. The land is spacious, for God has given it into your hands. A place where there is no lack of anything that is in the earth. So, so the report is, guys, we've got a ripe plum over here. These people over here are innocent and unsuspecting. 
They're rich and they have no defenses. Why go do what God told us to do when there's something so much easier and better? You want to go into that bitter place over there where they got chariots of iron? Or we can go over here where they're fat and they don't even own a knife. It's like, which, which, which one seems to you? And they actually have to encourage their countrymen. You can't, we can't even take this if you won't get off your butts and do something. It's like, yes, what God's asked us to do is too hard. In other words, the sloth had grown so much that even doing the thing that they shouldn't have done, which was easy, seemed an impossibility to those Danites who had refused to go in against the chariots of iron for so long. Verse 11, so 600 men of the tribe of Dan, armed with weapons of war, set out from Zorah and Eshtaol and went up and encamped at kiriath Jerim in Judah. On this account, that place is called Manahadan, or the camp of Dan to this day. Behold, it's west of kiriath Jerim. They passed on from there to the hill country of Ephraim, and they came to the house of Micah. So we're, we're getting the storytellers weaving in. You remember Micah? You remember those guys recognized him before? He is, let's call him, the priest prostitute. He's the guy who will do and say anything for followers and money. And so they come up to Micah's house. Verse 11, excuse me, 14. Then the five men who had gone to scout out the country of Laish said to their brothers, Do you know that in these houses there are an ephod, household gods, carved image, and a metal image? Now therefore, consider what you will do. And they turned aside there, and they came to the house of the young Levite. So they've come to the compound, the house that they go to in the compound. That belongs to the priest, the Levite, at the home of Micah. And they asked him about his welfare. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Now, the 600 men of the Danites, armed with their weapons of war, stood by the entrance of the gate. And the five men who had gone to scout out the land went up, and entered, and took the carved image to ephod, the household gods, and the metal image, while the priest stood by the entrance of the gate with the 600 men armed with weapons of war. In other words, Micah's getting robbed. And he's getting robbed of all of his idols. And the Danites were smart enough to attack through the gate that was guarded by the prostitute priest's house. So it has fallen to this prostituting priest to blow the whistle, to yell, hey guys, we're getting robbed, uh, to lock the gate, something. But they're smart enough to know. If you want to rob somebody, the best way is to find a pastor figure who's after money and power. Verse 18. And these went into Micah's house and took the image, the ephod, the household gods, the metal image. The priest said to them, what are you doing? They said to him, keep quiet. Put your hand on your mouth. Come with us. He's, this is a kidnapper. Be to us a father and a priest. Oh. The good kind of kidnapping, where you get a job. You remember what Micah said to him? What did Micah say to him? Come into my house. Be to me as a father. Be a priest. I'll pay you. I'll give you stuff. It's going to be, it's going to work out great. He agreed. And Micah said, alas, now I know the Lord will bless me because I've hired a priest. And now the priest is uh, not stopping the guys who are robbing Micah. Remember, Micah's supposed to be to him as a son. You know, one of his sheep in his flock. Oh, Micah, how are you today? And yes, oh, yes, very well. And Spirit of God be with you. And now here the robbers come. And the shepherd, what does he do? You guys need some help carting that stuff out? And uh, where are you all headed? And how much does it pay? Come be to us a father and a priest. Is it better for you to be a priest to the house of one man? Or to be a priest to a tribe and a clan in Israel? One family, one clan, or a whole tribe, Levite? The Levite scratches his chin for just a second, I think, and the priest's heart was glad. Yay! I love these robbers. These are the best kind of robbers. 
These are the kind of robbers who will take me with them and let me be a part of what they're doing. And I get to just what I get to be the guy when we get to where we're going. I'm going to be the head dude in charge. Senior pastor here of <coughs> a tribe. And you are, oh, I don't have time for you. How much money do you make? How many changes of clothes? Ah, here's my closet. Um, so his heart was glad. He took the ephod and the household gods and the carved image and went along with the people. They came in to take it. Hey, you want to go? Oh, oh, let me gather. <laughs> Show me the way. Uh, so they turned and they departed, putting the little ones of the livestock and the goods in front of them. So let me just stop there a second. Uh, we're sort of nearing the end, but I want to stop explaining for a minute and start preaching a little bit. Micah, who was the leader of his family and his clan, did not know the word, but he knew something close to the word. It seems that he didn't know the word. If he did, he's in big trouble. But he hired a guy who should have not only known better, but who should have taught Micah, who should have shepherded lots of people who are in the faith, get many things wrong, and that's why they need faithful pastors and elders and deacons and uh, children's church teachers. It's like, well, I get what you're saying, but no, not exactly like that. Hey, listen, you can't pay me. That would pervert the whole thing. Uh, this is the system that God set up. Here's how it's supposed to work, and we can participate in that, and I will help you. Instead of that, this Levite, this spiritual prostitute, allows this man to not only pay him and prosper him, but encourages it. So now you have this guy. I want to make this suggestion to you. I think that this Levite is essentially trading uh, being relevant for being right. And it's tempting. Think about it. Look, I'm just wandering around doing nothing. All I have to do is enter into this corrupt bargain, and then I'll have influence. Wouldn't it, which would we rather have? Those pagan idolaters out there influencing this man? Or me? I'm only a little corrupt. I'm, like, I'm much better, and it's like, if I don't do it, someone else will. But like, what am I going to do? Just wander around with no thing while the people, no, this is a much better, I would rather be relevant, have some influence, and be able to do something in this changing world, this changing environment, if the priests don't change with the times, will just fade away into nothing. He ought to have reject relevance for the brightness of God, for truth. It's like he seems to be the kind of guy who believes there's always a moderate position. Hey, like, listen, yes, yes, okay. We're the Israelites, and we worship God alone, and we sacrifice lambs in the way that God says. But we've got the Canaanites over here, and they have Molech, and uh, they burn their children to Molech. And like, listen, do we need a war here? Isn't there some halfway position that we can come to? Do we all need to fight about this? Listen, listen, I'm a peacemaker here. I am from God, and we're going to just burn half of the children. Is that so bad? And like, yes, that's terrible. There's right and there's wrong. There's good and there's evil. And the Canaanites are evil. And there are no Canaanites in this story. None. There are some people who are like the Canaanites. They're like, they live after the manner of the Canaanites, but they aren't them. But they're the easy target. And so here we have a story that's all about people inside the land of Israel harming people inside the land of Israel, not doing what they're supposed to. All of the victims in this tale are all people who are guilty, guilty, guilty. And the only thing that we can say is, well, one of them seemed to get some power for some time. That would be the prostituting priest. Everybody else kind of loses. And this priest, by being a spiritual prostitute, actually loses the one thing that God gave to him to make him special. For silver. So it's like, we live in that kind of a time. When the church is tempted, let me tell you, sorely tempted, to preach not just to the faithful few, 
but all I have to do is change my message a little. I can still preach from the Bible. I just won't be preaching the Bible. And lots of people love it. God is love. If I, I'll just take that bit out. I'll take it. And you know how many people I will get to applaud me and say, good job. And yes. And like, we're so happy to be in church today. But is it really church? Isn't it just prostitution? And this is what happens. When the people of God select spiritual leaders who are in their hearts are prostitutes, they get paid compliments that mean nothing, and they get robbed in the middle of the night as soon as a better opportunity comes somewhere else. Actually, the evangelical landscape is littered with congregations broken by prostitute pastors. Broken. And the worst part is, rather than going, we really oughtn't hire people like that anymore. They go, oh, here's another one. Maybe he'll do it. Come on in. It's like, hey, the last 10 of them didn't work out. Maybe you ought to find someone who can actually preach the word. Uh, no. Uh, the word of God is not known. Known only perhaps to this Levite, and this Levite would prepare to do something else. We can justify an awful lot to go in a brave new direction when the way that God has called us is hard. When we are facing chariots of iron, and there's a great and beautiful land not far off, just in a different direction, is so easy. What happens when you start following a spiritual prostitute? Well, it happens right here to these people, these Danites, who were primed by saying no to what God had asked them to do and deciding to do something different. They were primed and ready for this kind of spiritual prostitute. I'm going to say that as many times as I can this morning because it's so good. It's so just like dripping with truth. So read verse 21 very carefully with me. They turned and departed, putting the little ones and the livestock and the goods in front of them. In the ancient world, here's how you travel. If you were going into hostile territory, your armed men go first and they form a wedge. Then you put your women and your children, then the livestock behind. And then the expendable, like old men in the very far back to drive the livestock. The warriors go first. Why? Because if you encounter anything on the road, your armed men can handle it. And the worst case scenario is they could do an armed retreat and say, hey, guys, we can't go this way. We've got to go this way. You can save your family. They're getting the very order of battle wrong. They're putting the cart before the horse because they have made enemies of their own brothers. Now the people who are leading the train are the women and the children and the livestock, and the armed men are in the back because they're waiting for their own brothers to come up behind them and say, you just robbed us. And they could be like, yeah, but we got spears, and we're going away from you. Just leave us, a be uh, leave us be. That's what's happening here. Verse 22, when they had gone a distance from the home of Micah, the men who were in the houses near Micah's house called out, and they overtook the people of Dan. And they shouted to the people of Dan, who turned around and said to Micah, What's the matter with you, that you would come with such a company? <laughs> Talk about irony. It's like if you could accuse them of being the bad guy first, even though you know that you're the bad guy, then what can they say except for like, well, maybe we're both bad guys here. All right, what are you doing coming at us with armed people? You know. <laughs> and he said, You take my gods. That I made, and the priest that I made, and go away? And what have I left? How then do you ask me, what is the matter with you? Let me suggest to you that this prostituting Levite priest had done Micah a favor. Let me just suggest that to you. Does Micah see the deep irony? Hey, you stole my gods. I need to rescue them from your hand. Hey, you took my hired priest who works for money. I want him back. <laughs> it's like, what? Only by force of arms, man. Well, I'm not that powerful. What he should have done is said, oh, priest, whatever they're paying you, I'll pay you double. And that priest would have turned and come right back over. See you guys there. Uh, verse 25, and the people of Dan said to him, do not let your voice be heard among us. 
lest angry fellows fall upon you and you lose your life with the lives of your household. Then the people of Dan went their way. And when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back to his home. Now, why I suggest to you is that this Levite is probably something like a judge because he actually does for Micah what needs to be done, but Micah can't perceive it. It's like he actually, leave, he actually takes down all of the gods. They're removed from his household. All of the prostitution ups and marches away, but Micah cannot see that God has actually done him a favor. He can't see that. He's like, God got it. Now I'm going to have to reach into my pockets and cast another metal image. You know, let's, but that is the spirit of the time. Do what's easy. Do what makes you relevant to the people around you. Not what God has said. Uh, verse 27. But the people of Dan took what Micah had made and the priest who belonged to him, and they came to Laish. To a people quiet and unsuspecting, and struck them with the edge of the sword and burned the city with fire. And there was no deliverer because it was far from Sidon and they had no dealings with anyone. It was in the valley that belongs to Beth Rehob. Then they rebuilt the city and they lived in it. They named the city Dan. And the name of Dan after the name of Dan, their ancestor, who was born to Israel. But the name of the city was Laish at first. The people of Dan set up the carved images for themselves. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Moses, and his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. So they set up Michael's, Micah's carved image that he made as long as the house of God was at Shiloh. So like, now we actually learn right at the very end, plot twist. This is a flashback. You think it's after Samson? It's long before. This is, actually, this is actually just after the days of Moses. This is like Moses' kids went in and conquered the land, right? And Moses' grandson was the first generation of permanently settled. That's how they recognized his voice. He's a famous guy. He was Moses' grandkid. What the heck? So quick. You see, it actually, it just takes one. It just takes one generation to corrupt a nation. One. From Moses, Moses' kids did okay. His grandson started the perversion. Four silver. Four followers. Four influence. You see, they're conquering. Dan conquering through compromise does not give them a place to stop. Once we enter into compromise, there is no logical stopping point. You have to keep compromising to hang on to your gains. And so actually, it is the tribe, it becomes, even though Dan is supposed to be in the heartland, they're the most northern tribe. This is not God's doing. This is Jonathan's doing with the tribe of Dan. And they set up their golden image which was what Jeroboam recast in Dan and down in Samaria. In fact, it becomes a saying in Israel from Dan to Beersheba. Dan meaning the very, very northernmost. Now, who was the most corrupt tribe that went first into captivity? Dan. They fell to the Assyrians even before the entire Israelite nation fell to the Israelite. And they were before Judah. They were the first to get so repugnant to God's nose that he allowed them to be completely destroyed. But the book of Isaiah gives to us a prophecy that those who are in Dan, who are in Gilead, who are in the very far north, though they were the first to be plunged into darkness, they would be the very first to hear the good news of the Messiah who would reclaim them. And it was in this territory, it was in this territory, where Jesus began his ministry. It was in this territory where Jesus gathered his followers, his first followers. It was this territory which had fallen first, which God redeemed first. You see, our protection 
from this kind of story is completely simple. One, know the word. And like I said last week, it boils my blood as a pastor. That we live in a time where we have the highest literacy rates of all time ever. And the least literate church. We have not just the Bible printed. The Bible printed so cheaply that I can buy incredible Bibles for $10 a piece because we're a church and we have this little program. We can get these great Bibles for $10 a piece, hand them out for free. You can read it. There's many different apps that you can get it. You can get the Bible read to you on audiobook for free anytime, anywhere, and God's people don't. Now, of course, I don't mean you. I just mean all of the people that we are around. We have the most illiterate, biblically illiterate church that has ever been. The medieval ages, when they were trying to cure people from drowning by blowing water or air up inside their behind. That's how backwards they were. And they knew the Bible better than we do. It boils my blood. That's the first thing. We just have to know the word. We just have to read the word. God said, read it, know it, bind it to your forehead, strap it around your necks, teach it to your children while you're sitting down, while you're standing up on the way. Let them know this is the way. The way is known by the word of God. And then second, simply, we must make our aim to be pure, not to be popular. Now, it's tempting to be popular because popular fear feels way better than pure. <laughs> we, ought to we ought to desire the admiration of God and not the acclaim of man. We ought to desire to be burning with the brightness of God's spirit rather than living in the glitz of Babylon. We should desire to be inundated with the love of God, rather than the likability of this perverse generation. It is the day and the age that we are living in. We are living in the days of the book of Judges, where there is no king and everybody does just whatever he seems right. But we have the word of God. We have the people of God. And all we have to do is be pure. God promises that if his people will just be his people, if they will just do that, he'll do everything else. He'll do everything else. All we have to do is be the light in the darkness. Now, there are many people who will argue. But wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. Lights in the darkness. Have you ever been in a pitch black room? Somebody shines a spotlight in your eyes. It hurts. Okay, why don't we just dim our lights a little bit? Think about how many more people will come. It's so much easier to look at a very dim light than it is a bright light. Let's intentionally, let's, we live in a really dark age. Why don't we dim the lights so that we'll be more palatable to the creatures of darkness who are lost in darkness? The kind of lights where the demons themselves are like, come on in. We like your presence. Like, no, no, no. The people of God are the kind of lights that hurt your eyes. We're the kind of lights that drive the darkness away. We are the kind of lights that radiate the very presence of God. And all, all we have to do is be faithful to him. He will be faithful to us. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would help us to learn this lesson from the book of Judges, chapters 17 and 18. Father, we pray that you would put into us a spirit of discernment, that we would be able to recognize all of those prostituting pastors and priests who are out there. Father, that, you're, that we might know your word, that you might set us free. Father, that you would help us to reject being popular and gathering lots of followers. That you help us to reject that, to follow simply after you. That we would be known as people who are in the presence of God. Father, that by our testimony that you have made inside of us, by your power that is inside of us, you might desire to work turning 
more sons and daughters into the kingdom of light. Father, that you would raise up in this perverted generation a whole host of people who come to the light because it is light. That you would bring many sinners into your presence. That you would turn them into saints by the power of the Son of God. That you would arm them with every spiritual armament. That you would cause them to go out even further. Father, that we would live in a time that we would be able to tell our grandchildren, yes, I was alive when that mighty move of God happened. When God saved our country. When he saved the world through one small group of people who would not bend their knee to all the prostitution, to a people who would gather together and pray in your name, who would read your word, who would believe, Lord God, that you can do it. And we believe, Jesus Christ, you have already done it. And all we must do is follow you. Jesus, help us to be the kind of people who will follow you anywhere, even against the chariots of iron. We pray these things. In the name of Jesus Christ, the one true King of kings and Lord of lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the one who was and is and is to come. Amen.